Wow. Isn't God good? I think today I'm going to do a Mother's Day sermon. Good time to do that, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, in a Bits and Pieces uh, article in August 1989, I came across this. A little boy forgot his lines in a Sunday school presentation. And he just was, could, he just was blank. His mom was in the front row and she leaned forward and said, tried to sign the words and lip the words to him and he wasn't getting it. So she leaned a little further f- forward and says, I am the light of the world. Little guy got all sure of himself, and he stood up with a loud voice and said, My mom is the light of the world. (laughs) Pretty true. Pretty true. I tell you what, when I saw that, I says, I like that. I like that. But today we know, in fact, that the, the enemy who is the attacker and the destroyer, the accuser, is trying to destroy not only the family, he's trying to destroy motherhood, he's trying to destroy destroy fatherhood, trying to neutralize anything godly. Trying to destroy marriage, trying to destroy all the institutions that God has put in place. And so today I want to bring you a message that I believe will encourage as well as maybe even convict us. It did me. It took me back to some memories as a young man, and I'll probably share a couple of those today. It may take you back to some thoughts, because we are under a serious attack in society. But when I looked into the book of Isaiah, I was encouraged, chapter 49. I'm going to be reading probably most of it from the New Living Translation, but I I want to make some comments as I read through just a few verses. Chapter 49, verse 13, down to 18. Because I think there's something strong that we can glean from this. And so, I don't know how long it's going to be. It could be two and a half hours. No service tonight. But uh, everybody said, oh, I thought you were going to say, oh, me. (laughs) That's okay. Israel has been in captivity. Put this in perspective, because of their rebellion, because of their idolatry, because of sins that had separated them from God's presence. And everybody that's around knows that sin separates us, doesn't bring us together. And so Israel is, is feeling abandoned. They're feeling rejected. They're feeling No presence of God. Incredible picture as we go into this passage because here's what Isaiah says in this marvelous passage of God's Word. He's talking about the restoration of Israel. But I want you to see some things and some lessons that I believe will encourage us but challenge us and even convict. He says to us out of the Scripture in verse 13, Sing for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on them in their suffering. Yet Israel is feeling the absence of God's presence. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you've been forgotten, forsaken, abandoned? Ever feel that way? Yeah, it can happen. But the Lord says, not just the heavens rejoice, but earth rejoice. Even the inanimate objects of this earth, the mountains, let you rejoice. God says, I'll raise up the stones. If you don't worship me, I'll raise them up to worship me. So he promises to turn the captivity of the Israelite into rejoicing. Well, when you're going through the valley, it doesn't seem like that's what you want to do. When you're being beat up by the world, praising him and rejoicing and worshiping doesn't fit. But that's what he says. Here's what Jerusalem, the folks from Israel said. He says in verse 14, yet Jerusalem says, the Lord has deserted us. He has forgotten us. Mm. Who's deserted us? Who? That's my question. Who 
has deserted who? Now, but look at verse 15. I just think this is one, one of the neatest passages. How many know your mom said, never, never say never and never say always? Hmm? Anybody ever heard that? My mom would tell me, Bobby, don't you say never nor not. Don't you say always. Because all I have to do is find one instance where it is never or it is always, and you have just broken it. She's right. She's right. But the God of heaven says through Isaiah, never, say that with me, never. That's God saying that to you and me. Not one time will you find him not fulfilling his word, his promises, his love to you and me. Not one time. He says, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. Woo-hoo-hoo. Char's gone. Her life has ended on this earth. As awesome as she was as a mother, her days were numbered. And I was thinking about that this last week, and the reality is that the Lord is ever-present. He has never failed me. Pastor, but Char died, yeah? She did. But I'm going to see her again. I don't have to live in a self-pity party. I don't have to live discouraged, depressed. I can lift up my head into the hills from whence cometh my strength. I can rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Why? Because not only has her name been written in the Lamb's book of life, she's in the Lamb's arms. She's always, that's what we live to do is live with him forever. But even if it were possible, I would not forget you. I hope you catch that today. If you don't catch another word, I hope you catch that. You are ever on the Father's mind. Ever. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls and ruins. Soon your descendants will come back, and all who are trying to destroy you will go away. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody been under attack recently? Now, here's what I'm going to jump into real quick. Look around you and see, for all your children will come back to you. I'm going to speak to that a little more. As surely as I live, says the Lord, they will be like jewels or bridal ornaments for you to display. Wow. There was an old song my mom loved. She loved Nat King Cole. Some of you already know the song. What song am I talking about? Unforgettable. You want me to sing that? No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't even want me to hum it. But I do have the lyrics. Unforgettable, that's what you are. Unforgettable, though near or far, like a song of love that clings to me, how the thought of you does things to me. Never before has someone been more unforgettable in every way, and forevermore, that's how you'll stay. That's why, darling, it's incredible that someone so ungrettable, unforgettable, ungrettable, oh, that's a different word. (laughs) There we go. That someone so unforgettable thinks I am unforgettable too. Y'all ought to go home and play that song today. I'm sure you can get it on YouTube or some kind of iTunes. We need to hear that song. Not because Nat King Cole sang it, but because that's how I see God speaking to us today. You and I are unforgettable to Him. Unforgettable. What a passage. God gives us, as well as His people then, a hope a comfort, a strength, and an assurance, blessed assurance. When you sang that, it's my favorite song. My dad's was Amazing Grace. He didn't have my chains are broken back then, but he would have gone for it. But God has given us a great hope because he has not abandoned us and he has not forgotten us. Sometimes we feel like it. 
But the truth is, God has compassion for you and me like a mother has for her child. Nothing in this world can compare to the love of a mother. Brooks Ramsey made this observation years ago. He said this, and I, I, I quote him because it's just perfect. In the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, the word for compassion comes from the root word womb. Isn't that amazing that God would use compassion and he would speak from the mother's womb? Listen to how it says. The picture is one of a birthing. Something new is being born. Applying this concept to human experience, it means that compassion gives a person another chance, a fresh start. Isn't that mom? <laughs> Brody and Chris used to get in Dutch. That's our son and our daughter. Chris got in more Dutch than Brody. I don't know why. Maybe because she was a second child, got away with stuff. Brody would say to Char, he says, Mom, after he had confessed to what he had done, he says, do we have to tell Dad? Hmm? Mom, do you ever feel like that? And Char says, honey, I tell Dad everything. Do you really have to tell him? I don't want to make him feel bad. She says, what do you think I am? Moms, you get that, don't you? You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to disappoint Dad, but Mom, you're different. You know the very heartbeat that I have. You know how I can get in Dutch. You know how I can blow it big time. But do I have to tell Dad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a mother, here it is, always gives the babies another chance. Hmm? Mom, I'm not talking to dads right now. Dad, you can just close your ears up. But mom, your babies need to have your love even when they don't deserve it. They need to have your encouragement because your words can make them meet the world. See, I wasn't always there. I was gone a lot. Flying airplanes, I was away from the house. Sure, I had to be mom and dad sometimes, a lot of times. But I can tell you today that Brody and Chris remember as hard and tough that mama could be, she may correct them that moment, but within minutes she was back putting her love around them. God has had to discipline us throughout life because those he loves, he disciplines that's one of the things that this society doesn't understand. There's two things Dad Cookman reminded me of years ago when I first came in the ministry, and he preached it on a Thursday night, a Thanksgiving service. In a not so evangelical or Pentecostal service, and he says, folks, there's two things that our children need to know before they turn to. He says, number one, they need to know the word no. And they need to accept it. When mom and dad say no, they mean no. Because it may mean their life one day. When you say no, don't go. The second is they need to learn how to handle dis disappointments. Because life is, has more disappointments than it has victories. And we have created a society who never wants to hear the word no. And not just in children, it has grown up and it's now in adults. And we don't know how to handle disappointment. But quick advice. If you can't handle disappointment, you will find yourself falling out of the race. And God has made you to run the race and win. Learn to handle disappointment. You know what a lot of guys do? Well, I go down and I beat on a, on a heavy weight bag, get my frustration out. Can I tell you what David, the mighty warrior who slew 
10,000 at a time? What did he do? He got on his knees before God. He didn't have to go do a heavy bag. He didn't have to burn off energy. He didn't have to do all that stuff. We need to bring ourselves, men and women, back to the altar of God. And when life is disappointing, when life is not fair, when it seems like everything has gone kaput, you and I need to get ourselves back on our knees, hmm? not just beat out our frustration. We are living in a world that is frustrated, angry, and constantly bickering with life. You know what the Bible says about that? Preached on it a while back. You could probably go back and not more than two months ago and hear it. God's Word says that when you are exp experiencing those things, it is the highest form of pride. If anger is an issue in your life today, sir or ma'am, because it's not just sexually different, you need to check on your pride. You mean, might be wanting things your way, and they don't go your way, and life just doesn't feel fair. That was free. Wasn't even in my notes, but that's fair. Compassion from the womb, a fresh start, another chance. Mom, give your babies another chance, and that goes for dads too. Never write your babies off. Never write your babies off. I say this to us as men, we tend to compartmentalize and we can write them off. Mom, you can't because you may be the only encouragement they get. They need it from dad, but not all dads have that in them, but a mom does. From her very breath, they have been there. You have fed them. You have changed their diapers. You have loved them unconditionally. It's a wonderful picture. But even though a mother may go on and pass from this world, God's love will never, ever pass away. It'll never fail. I came across the passage in Romans 8 that I love, and I've read it many times. I, but I haven't used it in a Mother's Day sermon. But listen to this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the Scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Never think. God doesn't love you. You can't get far enough away to get away from his love. Even when you feel his absence, even when you feel rejected, even if you feel abandoned, his love is still there. God's love's an amazing thing. He first loved us. We sing the song, I love him because he first loved me. He loved us when we were unlovable, and boy, can I speak to that one. You've heard me speak to that about myself. And he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. But his love is not just on earth. His love is eternal. Thank you, Jesus. He has a deep love for his people because he chose them. He chose Israel. Can I tell you what? You and I think we chose Christ. He had us in his eye and on his mind before we ever even knew it. He chose us first. Now, I want you to see something in this passage in verse 16. It says this. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. I want to show you something here. Israel knew exactly what he was talking about. 
Because whenever they were taken into captivity or when they were going to have to go somewhere and they were going to be away from those they loved for an extended period of time, they would also often begin to tattoo the name of their love in their hand. God says here, I have, tat- I have tattooed you into my hands. Not just one, into both. So every time I look at this, I see you, Israel. I see you, Dylan, Brett. As rough as your life had been as a youngster, I see you preaching the gospel. Danny, I see you with a gift of helps that's beyond your own understanding. He says, I have tattooed. Now, God, why would you break your own Levitical law where it says you shouldn't mark your body? I want to take you back to another picture to show you something. Remember in Genesis 22 when God said to Abraham, take your only begotten son, Isaac, and take him up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him on the altar, and he will be consumed. But the Bible says thou shalt not kill. What was God doing? It's an anthri- anthropomorphism. That's what they call it. He's giving you a physical picture so you can comprehend a part, an aspect of him. Here's what I know. God was saying to Abraham in Genesis, do you love me as much as the world loves their God of fire, Molech? And Abraham says, Father, I do. God was saying to Israel, y'all mark your bodies. Put in your hands the names and the places that are so dear to you so that every place you go, you can see it. It's like the sailor who is getting ready to go to sea, maybe go to war, or the army guy. We used to have a chief Chief Master Sergeant in the Navy. (laughs) He had tattoos. Most of them were women he'd been with. He used to laugh about these. He says, that's why I wear long sleeves today. But he had Joy's name on his arm. That was his wife. And he never wanted to forget her. He's gone. Joy never forgets him. Chuck wanted to remember his wife forever. Tattooed. The sailors do it. Israel would do that. Now, here's what I want you to catch today. Today, God in those days... God is spirit. He had no hands. He had no feet. But when Jesus came to this earth, think about this. He now had hands and feet. And when he hung on that cross and they nailed him and put those spikes through his hands and his feet, he inscribed you and me in the palms of his hands. And he said, my love will never be away from you. Heaven and earth can pass away, but my word won't, and neither will his love. When I thought about that, I thought, Lord, thank you that today, as blessed as Israel is, as wonderful as it's going to be one day, when you come back, we have it better. I wrote down some things. I thought, wow, what a relationship God has given us today. Because when you think about what he is doing, he has promised to keep us before him always. That's why in Isaiah 49, 16, the second part, he says, always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls and ruins. If you've got a home today that's in ruins, I want you to know something. God knows where you're at. He knows the walls that need to be resecured. And he cares. He says, watch me. Watch me. When everything seems ruined, here's what Dad Cookman often quoted. What's happening is not what's going on. 
What's happening is not what's going on. What you see with your, your naked eye is not what really is happening underneath the soil where God is working. God has given us promises. He's guaranteed his word to us. We need to hold on to that. Wow. God cares. God cares. And I want to encourage you really on my last point, I think. What God has begun, he will bring to fulfillment. How many of you had wayward children? Anybody? You praying for them? If you have wayward children, I would encourage you to commit this to memory. Look around you, verse 18, and see. For all your children will come back to you as surely as I live, says the Lord. They will be like jewels or bridal ornaments for you to display. Isn't that powerful? Some of you got grandkids that are growing up and your children walk with the Lord. I remember when I used to cry out to God for my own kids. Brody had gotten really hard. If you're watching this, I owe you $5. Every time I use my kids in an illustration, it's $5. Don't you wish you were my kids? That's okay. When I used Shars, it was 25 she had the checkbook. <laughs> that was Dad Cookman's fault. He's the one who gave her the idea. Some of you don't know who Dad was, but he was my second dad. He was my mentor. But this passage is so wonderful because I do know that sometimes our kids get off track. And sometimes our grandkids get off track. Mine, I, I got to tell you, one of the greatest days in my life was when my little eight-year-old on Easter morning comes down to the front and says, I want Jesus in my heart. I was a noodles the rest of the day. Why? What shall a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his family? It doesn't say it that way. I'm putting words to it. But loses his own soul. Look around you and see, for all your children will come back to you. Here's what I want to tell you. Don't give up on your babies. Don't give up on your family. Maybe your husband's not here today, and maybe you're struggling with it because you, you wish you could sit with him today. You wish that he would make a decision for Christ, but he's out doing what he wants to do. And here you are in church and you cry. I have seen many, 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 many women. I have grown up in the assemblies of God and independent assemblies. And I have seen women come to church for years and years and years and cry out to God for their loved ones. And I've watched God consistently be faithful to the cry of the heart. Mom, Dad. Grandma, Grandpa, don't ever give up praying and trusting God to answer your cries. I know what Philippians 1, 6 says to us. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is going to complete what he's promised to you. We don't need Nat King Cole to remind us that we are unforgettable in the eyes of God. We're his, and he has his eyes on us, and his promises are us and for us, and our future's bright. But here's where I'm at, and this is where I leave us. If God feels distant to you, or you feel like he's forgotten where you're at, the question is not where's God where are we? That's what I had to look inside to say. When God does not feel close, when I can't feel his presence, God hasn't changed. 
I have. Maybe you have. Because he told me that he would never leave me nor forsake me and that nothing can separate me from his love but me. And finally, how many know what that means in, in Greek? It's my first closing of five. No, I'm joking. I got two more hours. Holy smokes. Y'all are looking at your watch now, just wondering. The Lord brought back to my memory a Wednesday night when I was just about ready to turn 21. Not quite. Shar and I were serious about getting married. But we weren't married. She stayed up at school at Iowa, and I went home for a I don't even know why I went home. God knew, but I'm not sure I knew until it was done. And on a Wednesday night, not a big congregation was there. Dad was preaching. Why would Dad preach on salvation on a Wednesday night? Mom had come down from the organ playing it, and she, we were sitting on the third row where she liked to sit, and we were sitting together. And I really wasn't listening to the sermon. I just knew I was empty. I had gotten to the point that I had hardened my heart. I was a preacher's kid, but I wasn't going to be a wimp. I wasn't going to be a sissy. And I remember sitting there almost stoic until the compassion of mom said, honey, don't you think it's time to come home? Well, she wasn't talking about coming to 3203 Humber Road. She was talking about coming back to my first love, to Jesus. Raised up. Mom and dad who loved me unconditionally when I was unlovable, a lot like God does. And I says, I think I need to go to the altar. And I didn't have to walk by myself. Mom walked right down with me. And you've heard me talk about me saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't even love me. So you're going to have to give me a gift of love because I don't know how to love anymore. If you're ever going to use me, you're going to have to restore my tears because I don't even know how to worship anymore. And, Lord, you're going to have to teach me to love the unlovable because I don't love people like I ought to. And he began to do a work. And I've thought about this this whole week. Had Mama not had that compassion, love for another chance, I wouldn't be standing here today. How God can do it, I don't know. But what I do know, when God is distant, he hasn't moved. We have. I don't know where you're at today. I know me. I know how much last night I was listening. I don't know. If, how many of you remember Sandy Patty singing Arise and singing all those songs? I put that on my CD last night. I had a worship service before this morning. And all I could do was sit there and weep and praise him because somebody loved me enough to give me another chance. And God used the compassion of a mom that says, honey, don't you think it's time to come home? And that's what I say even to us today. Is it time to come home? Maybe you're a young person. You just came here with mom and just wanted to make her feel special. And you do. 
I want you to know something you do. But the most wonderful thing you can give mom on a Mother's Day is the knowledge that you have come home, not just to the house, but to the King of Kings, to the Lord and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest thing we could do because my mom never forgot that Wednesday night. This isn't Wednesday night, but mom, maybe you have some children who are wayward today. They might not even be here. You're going to meet them later on today, but your heart still aches because they're not walking close with the Lord. We're going to pray with you today. Maybe as a young person or maybe as an older child, maybe as a husband, maybe today is the day to come on home. We used to sing a song, come home, come home, it's supper time. Remember that? I remember that song. I don't know the words, Beth. I've forgotten it. It's been so long since I've sung it, but it just rolled through my being this morning. Come home, come home, it's supper time. Whew. Maybe it's supper time here at First Assembly. I want to encourage you today. If it's time for you to come home, come on home. Come on home. Because somebody loves you more than you love you. And it's not just mom. It's God. It's Jesus. It's his Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads a second. If today is the day for you to come home, maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. You've been out away from the Lord's presence and you haven't felt him in a long time. But today you want his presence back in your life. You may want to just rededicate your life. You may want to just say, Lord, I've been running too hard the wrong way. But today, I'm coming home. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you're at. Stand. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? You've run long enough. And today is a day we're coming home. We're coming home. We're coming home today, Lord. It's been too long without your presence. the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Anybody else? <laughs>